Welcome to the Galaxy Training Network's Smorecast Board tutorial on Metaproteomics. My name is Pratik Jagtap from the Galaxy P team at the University of Minnesota. And I'll be introducing you to the Galaxy workflows for Metaproteomics research. So what is Metaproteomics? It is the characterization of proteins and functions expressed by microbiome in response to its environment. The GTN tutorial for metaproteomics can be found here in this link. Microbiome research has been in forefront in addressing questions about the effect of microbiomes on human health and disease. For example, scientific literature in gut microbiome research has multiple effects that correlate the taxonomic composition of gut microbiomes to the physiological conditions. Environmental researchers have also studied the effect of microbiomes on soil, aquatic systems, and even oceans in environmental research. Microbiome researchers have greatly benefited by studying the DNA of microbes from clinical or from environmental samples. Metagenomic studies, which involve analyzing sequences to detect taxonomy of the microorganisms, is a mature field with advanced bioinformatic approaches to correlate the microbial composition to the phenotype. In recent years, researchers have started studying the RNA expressed by microbiomes to understand the gene expression in response to conditions. Metatranscriptomics research not only helps us understand the microbial taxonomic composition, but helps in characterization of functions expressed by the microbiome. Metaproteomics, which is the topic of this tutorial, has been used to study the microbiomes using mass spectrometry methods wherein microbial proteins are characterized. The identified proteins are assigned to biological functions, thus helping us understand how the microbiome reacts to its immediate environment. Peptides that are identified and are unique to taxonomic units such as genus, species, or even strains are used to detect the taxonomic composition of the microbiome. Metaproteomics researchers, including us, believe that metaproteomics research has a huge potential to unravel the mechanistic details of microbial interactions with the host or the environment. Metaproteomics and its definition has changed over the years as the field has evolved as newer sample preparation, data acquisition, and bioinformatics analysis methods have emerged. In general, there is an appreciation of the fact that metaproteomics offers an insight into functions that are expressed by a microbiome. To illustrate this point, imagine that you have a microbiome that is exposed to dissimilar conditions such as nutrition. The proteins and functions that are expressed in response to this nutrition are different as compared to the similar taxonomy that has been shown here. On the other hand, you can start with a dissimilar taxonomic composition of a microbiome and then treat it with a similar condition or nutrition and the microbiome expresses a similar set of proteins or functions. To illustrate this point further, here is an example wherein we analyze a data set from Magnus Ansen's laboratory at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. Sample from thermophilic biogas plant was inoculated into a large uh, lab scale reactor 
for growth on cellulose. The bottles were inoculated at 65 degrees Celsius and collected at nine different time points and processed in triplicates. Mass spectrometry data was acquired on all time points and we performed metaproteomics analysis on four of these time points, eight hours, 23 hours, 33 hours, and 38 hours. And we call them T1, T4, T6, and T7. Based on the analysis of the proteins and functions and their abundance values, the principal component analysis separates time point T1 from other time points which are clustered together. On the other hand, if one used taxonomy abundance values based on the metaproteomics data, it does not separate these time points as well as seen when we use functional data points. This highlights the importance of understanding the functional state of the microbiome in order to understand how the microbiome responds to the environment. With this, let us move on to the hands-on session. And for this, we will go to the Galaxy Training Network website, which has this metaproteomics tutorial. And when we will use these inputs as well as workflows on the Galaxy Europe website. In this session, we will understand how to generate a new history, how to access a data library, and transfer the inputs from that data library. In order to locate the metaproteomics tutorial on Galaxy Training Network, you can go to the Galaxy Training Network's website and then scroll down to the topic proteomics to locate the metaproteomics tutorial. So in the proteomics tutorial website, you'll find metaproteomics tutorial. And if you click on this link here, it takes you to the website of the metaproteomics tutorial. The metaproteomics tutorial has various sections. It starts with an overview, which has questions as well as objectives, and also some input data set workflows. And it also shows you on which Galaxy instances this particular tutorial is available. So as you can see, it's available in Africa, in Europe, in Norway, as well as on the Galaxy Australia web server. We're going to carry out our analysis on the use Galaxy EU network today. If you keep scrolling down, it gives you an introduction as well as uh, tells you on how to upload the data set and takes you through the analysis uh, and its steps uh, for this particular tutorial. At the end of the tutorial, you will find a feedback form which we recommend that you fill in so that we can make changes to this, new to this tutorial as needed. Next, we will go to the Galaxy EU website and we'll start with generating a new history so that input data sets can be transferred to this new history. The way to do it is use this plus sign. And when you click on it, it generates a new history, which is unnamed. So you can name it as metaproteomics GTN, for example. And now in order to transfer the input data sets into this history, we will go to shared data. And within the shared data, we'll go to data libraries. Once you click on data libraries, you'll find a name called GTN material. Click on that. Once you do that, you will see different categories of tutorials, including one on proteomics. So if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a proteomics link here. Click on that. 
and within proteomics you'll see tutorial meta proteomics third in line here and if you click on that you'll see a doi link uh, or a zenodo link uh, that has all the input data sets that we need for this tutorial if you click on that it gives you these six input files out of which we're going to use the top five input files we do not need the sixth one so we'll use this five input files and export to the history as data sets so you you can now export it to this current history that we have generated or if you have forgotten to do that do that you can generate it in a new history as well so let's go with this meta proteomics gtn history that will import these files into so once i say import it has already imported these files into this uh, history <clears throat> once i go back to this history as you can see these files have been named uh, have been um, placed in this history and the first thing that we'll do here is we will remove the um, the website link to this and just keep the names of the files so starting with the first one i i have removed the website link and i save so the way i do it is i go to this pencil mark click on it it shows me the name and then i only select for the file name and delete anything else we do the that uh, the same procedure for the fasta file as well and lastly for the tabular file as well right now so we are ready with our input data sets and one uh, one more thing that we will be doing and this is something that is generally performed in most of the proteomics analysis is since you might have fractionated your data set in which case we would like to search this data set uh, as a single output from these three raw files we will generate a data set collection and for that you click on this check box check mark uh, box here and then select those that you would like to generate a data set collection from and so for all selected build a data set list and i'm going to name them uh, bearing straight mgfs and i'll explain you soon why we call this um, why it's called bearing straight and then once this is done it generates this data set collection so what data set collection basically does now is it has this mgf files which are now searched uh, against this database that we have and it will generate a single output from this so just to summarize um, there are these three mgf files which are mass spectrometry files there is this protein fasta file or metapeptide fasta file there is a tabular file uh, of gene ontology terms that would be used for assigning gene ontology later in the workflow and the last one number 9 is a collection of these three files which will be processed so that it can generate a single output with this let's move on to try to find out what these input files are now that we have downloaded these data sets into our galaxy histories let's try and understand what these input data sets are about so these mass spectrometry data sets were acquired from the lab of dr brook nun at the university of washington in seattle 
ocean water samples were collected from the Bering Strait and Chukchi Sea and the oceanic marine bacteria were retained using a filter. The mass spectrometry data was acquired on Q-Exactive HF instrument and an associated shotgun metagenomics data was also acquired. The attendees are strongly recommended to read this manuscript to understand more about this data set as well as its analysis. In order to understand more about metaproteomics data acquisition, let's go back and understand how a mass spectrometry data is acquired. On the left are shown proteins that are isolated from the sample and are later digested using an enzyme such as trypsin. This digestion leads to generation of peptides. And since these are complex peptides, one needs to separate them using multidimensional fractionation methods such as liquid chromatography so that they can be ionized in the mass spectrometer. These ionized peptides, also called as MS1 signals or precursor signals, are eventually fragmented in a mass spectrometer. The peptides are isolated and then fragmented and then eventually mass analysis is performed so that it generates a mass spectrum which has intensity on the y-axis and the mass to charge ratio on the x-axis. In single organism proteomics, the mass spectra that are acquired from your mass spectrometry experiment are matched against protein, against protein phosphatidyls to identify peptides. Shown here is one such mass spectrum which was assigned a peptide and this peptide was then assigned to cytochrome C which is a protein. In single organism proteomics, it's relatively easy to assign a peptide to a protein or a protein group. The situation in metaproteomics is slightly different. For example, in metaproteomics, these challenges are slightly more pronounced. For example, in single organism proteomics, wherein you're studying uh, an organism such as human sample or yeast sample or any bacterial sample, your database size is generally very small, around 10,000 sequences to 100,000 sequences. And the complexity is not very high. You have your proteins that come from this particular organism along with contaminants. While if you're studying a metaproteomic sample, you're starting with a multiple set of microorganisms. And hence, when you're searching a database, especially if you're looking at a public repository database, your database is almost a million or sometimes larger than that. And there are multiple proteins which are homologous to proteins that are present and, and shared within different organisms. And hence, there are quite a few challenges uh, with metaproteomics analysis. For example, there have been search algorithms that have been developed to address large and complex database searches. The protein grouping needs to be done at multi-organism level. Identification statistics are affected by large databases. The taxonomy is based on unique peptide identifications. And then the functional analysis based on proteins that can be identified. So for all of these, you actually require quite a few software tools and multiple processing steps. And hence, Galaxy as a platform has really helped us in this, wherein you can bring in this multiple software tools, build a workflow, and then run these workflows on multiple samples. To get an idea about how a metaproteomics workflow functions. Let's start with the mass spectrometry data as we discussed earlier. This mass spectrometry data generates multiple spectra as we looked at uh, as we looked at before. 
and then from fastq files and these fastq files come from come from your mass uh, metagenomics data you can generate a protein fast file you basically take your mass spectrometry data and match it against this protein fast file to identify peptides so this first method uh, of generating database is is an important method because you want to ensure that you have the right composition of proteins in your sample and if your database is large or if it is small you might end up using various database search strategies to identify these peptides however once these peptides are identified you can go and try to identify the taxonomic composition of these peptides or of this sample and your peptides are of different forms you could have unassigned peptides you could have shared peptides or you could have unique peptides peptides that are unique to a particular species genus or even a strain and these unique peptides are the ones that you use to identify a particular taxonomic unit the other part that peptides can be used for is that you can use them to identify proteins one thing to remember here as we mentioned earlier is that these proteins are sometimes shared within multiple organisms but that does not prevent us from identifying the function of these proteins so all of these four components database generation database search taxonomy analysis and functional analysis constitute to a metaproteomics workflow now that we have these basics of a metaproteomics workflow let's move on back to the hands on session and download and then start a workflow and we'll run this workflow against the inputs that we had downloaded earlier we will observe the outputs that come out of this workflow and while we are waiting for this workflow to generate these outputs we can go back and look at some of the basics of the software tools that are used in this workflow so let's go again back to our galaxy eu instance in order to the down, in order to download the workflow there are two ways one can download the workflow um you can either go to shared data and use click on workflows and then in this list you'll see metaproteomics gtn workflow so you can use that and say import and then you can start using this workflow right so that's one method of getting this workflow the other method of getting the same workflow is if you go to metaproteomics tutorial website there is this link for workflows under supporting materials so click on that link click on workflow.ga file and then it downloads this .ga file workflow.ga file in your download and now you can go to your website and click on import and then browse and under downloads you will find your workflow file and you can import this file so i just showed you two different ways of downloading a workflow file but for this tutorial we can use either of them so let's maybe use this second one the one that we downloaded from the gtn website and the way to uh, invoke a workflow is you click on this 
or you can click on this arrow button here run workflow and once you do that it shows you the various inputs that you can use here based on the history that you have generated and also various steps or tools that have been used here you can also use the edit workflow option to look at the layout of this workflow so just to give you an idea about what this workflow has um, we can we can look at um, the input files. So the input files here is this data set collection of MGF files that we had generated as a data set collection. The protein FASTA file generated from six skill. And then this would, these two uh, would be searched against, uh, uh, to, to, you know, searched using various search algorithms within search GUI. And as you can see here, uh, it has used X tandem and MSGF plus and then processed with peptide shaker and then it uses tools such as query tabular tool unipept analysis and then eventually another query tabular tool to generate outputs that give us an information about the functional as well as taxonomy analysis so I can also run the workflow from from here if I click on this run workflow option and once you do that it takes us to that same page that we saw earlier so the first input is the protein faster file and that's number four um, and the workflow chooses this chooses this file based on the data input type. So since there's only one protein FASTA file, that's what is chosen as this workflow. Uh, in certain histories, you might have multiple uh, data types or multiple files with the same data type, and that might sometimes lead to you to uh, choose the right input file. But in this case, that's not a problem because there's only one protein FASTA file. Uh, the data set collection for the MGF files, uh, which are the converted uh, mass spectrometry files, uh, have been selected here. And the third input was the gene ontology terms. Feel free to scroll through and uh, look at what are the parameters that have been used for these searches. So as you can see, uh, there are these two search engines that have been used. Uh, protein digestion options it was uh, trypsin was used to digest these proteins and hence we we selected trypsin uh, for precursor options uh, precursor iron tolerance was at 10 ppm or 10 uh, 10 ppm and then the fragment tolerance was at 0. 0.5 daltons uh, and then there are these various um, parameters that were chosen so that peptides could be matched against uh, the spectra. For protein modification, there were no fixed modifications or variable modifications that were chosen here. Um, so these are the few options that you have, at least for the search GUI uh, part, and so on and so forth. You can uh, kind of keep scrolling down and try to find out you know, what are the parameters for each tool. Uh, and one thing uh, to be noted is that depending upon your data set, once uh, you start analyzing these uh, workflows or you know your samples on your own data sets, uh, it is important to note that you might uh, want to check on these parameters so that you get optimal outputs from these um, workflows. So, um, you know, so once we have all of these parameters checked, or you know, for, at least for this data set, we are quite certain that these parameters have been properly um, uh, checked. So, I'm go going to basically uh, start running this workflow um, since I'm sure that these input files are in right shape as well as the parameters have been properly set. I go ahead and run this workflows. <clears throat> So the first thing that happens after you run a workflow, as you must have seen in other tutorials, is 
that uh, you uh, these uh, tutorials, uh, th these uh, uh, workflows start loading in the history items. So um, there are going to be as many as 13 steps in this history and um, you can see these start showing up. So there is a search GUI, which is the first step wherein you're matching your uh, spectra against your protein FASTA file, the peptide shaker inputs uh, or outputs that are generated. And then uh, there is a query tabular tool uh, about which we'll talk a little bit later, as well as Unipep tool that is, that is uh, invoked in this workflow. And then eventually um, at the end, we will see there are these four outputs that are generated. There is this uh, taxonomy information in terms of genera and number of PSMs and peptides, uh, go terms either as biological processes or molecular functions or cellular localization. Um, so while this uh, workflow is uh, is running, let's go and uh, learn a little bit more about search go and peptide shaker and then come back once this um, workflow uh, all, all these uh, history items have turned green. So as you can see, initially it turns yellow and then later it would turn green after your um, your search is complete. Uh, and the same would apply for the rest of these history items as well. While we are waiting for our history to get completed, let's try to understand some of the tools that are present in this workflow. The first tool, which is the search GUI tool, which matches your MSMS spectra against your protein sequences, uses multiple search algorithms. For example, in our workflow, we have used Xtandem, MSGF Plus, and OMSA as three tools that can be used to search our data set. This helps in increasing the number of identifications. You can also specify the enzyme that was used to digest your proteins. Based on your mass spectrometry measurements and the quality of the data, you can also specify the mass error both at the precursor MS or MS MS level so that you can identify spectral matches. Lastly, Search GUI also allows you to specify post translational modifications such as fixed modifications or transient modifications so that you can identify peptides. The generated from Search GUI are processed by another tool, Peptide Shaker. Peptide Shaker filters these search GUI results using false discovery rate analysis so that you can yield the most confident peptide spectral matches. Remember that Peptide Shaker generates outputs such as protein report, peptide report, and MDM identimal files apart from the peptide spectrum report that we have been processing. These reports help you to perform a subsequent analysis of your data set, especially if you're interested to know more about the protein level or the peptide level, or even visualization of some of the spectra using these file outputs. Now that we have covered these tools, Search GUI and Peptide Shaker, Let's go back to the history and see if our searches are over. Now that your history has run, uh, and as you can see here, the search GUI ran through, and uh, one of the ways to look at some of the parameters that were run, or even um, rerun this, would be to click on this uh, the circular arrow icon and <clears throat> find out what were the parameters that we used here. And we had already looked at these earlier 
trypsin was used, uh, precursor options were used, uh, 10 ppm and 0.5 Dalton. Uh, and so basically this, this helps you to uh, ensure that you have run this, um, this search query uh, in the appropriate, using the appropriate parameters. The next step is a peptide shaker. And as you can see here, peptide shaker has this mzidentml file that is used, uh, that is generated. Uh, we are not going to use mzidentml in this particular tutorial, but the mzidentml can be useful for uh, other applications such as um, the multi-omics visualization platform, which helps you to uh, analyze your data and even visualize some of the spectra or perform genomic uh, coordinate visualizations as you will learn about in the proteogenomics tutorial. Um, what we are going to use in this particular tutorial is the PSM report. And uh, PSM report is one of the multiple reports that are generated by Peptide Shaker. So if you, if you look at what are the outputs Peptide Shaker generates, you can see there are quite a few outputs that uh, peptide shaker generates. Uh, we also have the protein report and the peptide report generated, though in this particular it was hidden. So if you go to hidden and unhide these, you'll see there is a protein report here, number 14 and number 13. So even though you do not see this in a history, they are still present here and you can always unhide them in case you want to uh, look at what's there in this particular report. So uh, coming back to the PSM report, which is what we are going to use for this um, for this this particular tutorial. If I click on this uh, eye icon, I'll see that uh, what are the proteins it comes from. And the reason why these proteins look like peptide sequences is because these proteins or this protein FASTA file was generated through six gil which basically takes in FASTQ file and uh, converts it into peptide FASTA outputs. And those peptide FASTA outputs or the sequences generated were used at, as headers. And that's why you see this as, um, as these sequences. Uh, generally, you would have uh, protein names uh, or even uh, protein accession numbers uh, in this place. Uh, and then in this PSM report, if you keep scrolling on to the right, you will see um, <clears throat> the peptide sequence um, and other information associated with this peptide sequence. Uh, so feel free to scroll through this, understand what it means. Uh, if you have any questions regarding these columns or what these mean, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, but for sake of um, uh, this uh, tutorial, I'll keep uh, going, uh, proceeding further so that we can we can cover much ground. So. One other important thing I wanted to mention here is um, there is this confidence parameter. Uh, and in this particular case, we have decided to only use those uh, peptides which have at least a 95% confidence. So the next step that we have used is this tool called as query results. Um, and so in order to kind of understand what it does is um, you basically uh, click on this um, click on this uh, circular arrow icon and the query tabular uh, tool is a tool which basically takes in tabular files so what this particular uh, tool does is, is that it leverages the sqlite database and uses regular expressions to parse out useful information from tabular files um, so one of the uh, advantages of this query tabular tool is that if you have multiple tabular outputs getting generated or that have been generated through your workflow or in your history and if you want to somehow uh, make some correlations or want to parse out information from each of these uh, you can use some regular expressions but before that it generates this SQLer, uh, SQLite database from which you can parse out this uh, information. So in order to generate a workflow with query tabular tool, um, you definitely do require some knowledge of uh, structured uh, query language or SQL. Although use of query tabular significantly uh, has shown to improve 
the development and application of multi-step workflows in in uh, when we have used it in Galaxy. So um, we have started using this query tabular tool um, for multiple studies using metaproteomics as well as proteogenomics. So what this particular tool is doing has done is it's taken this PSM report and then by using this um, uh, this uh, regex um, uh, regular expressions. Uh, it has generated a list of peptides or distinct peptides that are uh, present in this sample. And then as you can see here, it has selected only those that are that have a confidence of at least 95 um, and has generated this list of distinct peptides. Now, this distinct peptides um, are eventually uh, processed by this tools tool called as Unipept. And uh, we, we'll, uh, we'll learn a little bit more about Unipept um, and then come back to uh, understanding what, um, uh, what 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 outputs we get out of it. Unipept is an open source web application developed at the Ghent University that is designed for metaproteomics data analysis. Unipept is powered by an index containing all Unipro entries and a custom lowest common ancestor algorithm. Shown here in an example for a peptide shown in the first column can be assigned to multiple proteins since this is a metaproteomics sample and then can be assigned to multiple taxa and then Unipep performs taxonomy analysis to assign this to the lowest common ancestor, which is the streptophyta taxonomic unit. Unipep performs analysis for all the peptides that are submitted. And then by using this method, one can identify specific organisms that are present in a sample. For this, Unipep uses multiple suite of tools such as Pepto-Pro, Prot to Taxa, Taxonomy, and so on and so forth. Unipep also generates quite a few visualization outputs, as has been shown here. And it can also generate functional outputs such as gene ontology terms, interpro terms, as well as EC terms for protein identification. Attendees are strongly recommended to go and read publications for Unipept at this link here. So if you look at Unipept outputs now, the first one that it's generated is uh, Unipept pep to prot output. And uh, if you look at this output, which is number 16, <coughs> you'll see the peptide, uh, the Uniprot ID. So as, as, you, as I mentioned earlier, Unipro uh, or Unipept searches against the Unipro database and finds out uh, which organism it comes from, uh, what are the EC numbers associated with if with this peptide? Uh, what is the protein uh, EC number associated with this peptide? What are the GO terms associated with it? Um, and so that's that's the information you get uh, from this particular um, from this particular table. Uh, there are also other uh, outputs that it generates, such as RFseq IDs, um, as well as uh, you know uh, other other outputs that are generated. But for this particular tutorial. We, we will be using um, this, the go term output or gene ontology term outputs so that we can uh, look at this. The other output that Unipep generates is this taxonomy output. And if you, uh, if you so we are looking at data set number 17. If you click on this visualize data icon with, with bars here, it gives you an option of using uh, visualization plugins. So the visualization plugin that we're going to use here is Unipept Taxonomy Viewer. 
if I click on this, it opens this tree view option, which basically um, you can uh, interactively visualize so uh, so as to look at what are the different taxonomy uh, units that have been identified here. So if you click on this large blob here, uh, which is of proteobacteria, uh, you can uh, you can basically keep clicking on these, and if you if you scroll around here, you'll it basically tell you, for example, at this particular taxonomic position there are 29 unique sequences so if you click on this one uh, you can see that uh, you know these start getting uh, associated with different um, genera here and if you click on uh, this other one uh, which is candidatus uh, pelagibacter uh, you will see if you click on that you'll see that there are uh, at least uh, four spaces, uh, four sequences that are um, that are um, specific to this particular um, sequence, and uh, you know, it, it, if you, you can also click on that so that you can see if there are any uh, species level identifications. And as you can see, uh, there are as many as 25 species associated, or 25 sequences associated associated with this species. So uh, you can keep scrolling around and and. Uh, look at more information that you can get out of um, out of this particular um, uh, tree view, and uh, this is quite interesting because it kind of helps you to interactively visualize and look at some of the other species or some of the interesting species that you would uh, like to um, like to see if they were observed in this particular data set. Uh, the other output that uh, Unipep generates is this. Unipept PEP2 LCA output. So remember, we talked about the lowest common ancestor. Uh, so using that algorithm, if you click on this or if you use the eye icon to look at uh, what's the output from this, uh, it'll show you that there is this peptide sequence, and then uh, it gives you which super kingdom, which kingdom, which sub kingdom, and so on do these particular peptides belong to. Um, and you can see that in some cases, some of these peptides are present in all bacteria while some peptides uh, can be identified at uh, order level uh, in, in this case rhodobacterials or uh, if you keep scrolling down you'll also found find some of these um, that are found in genera for example there is this one uh, polaribacter um, and you know so this particular peptide uh, the first peptide here is specifically identified or uniquely identified to this uh, genus polaribacter um, in some cases, you might also find that there are some uh, some of these peptides are found in uh, Pelagibacter uh, ubique, which means it's uh, at the species level. Uh, and so it basically gives you an idea about um, the depth at which you can identify these peptides at, right? Depending upon uh, how unique these are. So, so this is really useful information. And then um, we basically use all of this information from the PSM report as well as from your um, Unipep outputs, both at functional and taxonomy, uh, taxonomy level. Uh, and again, use this um, SQLite database, the query tabular tool that I mentioned earlier uh, to generate these outputs. So one of the outputs that it, it generates, uh, which is which is useful for a biologist to look at is uh, the various number of genera that are identified. So as you can see here, uh, the candidate candidatus uh, pelagibacter uh, was identified with at least 398 uh, PSMs and 29 peptides. So remember, we looked at this pelagibacter and there were 29 peptides that were associated at the general general level. Um, so that's what's been shown here. Um, there is nitrosopumulus, uh, um, which is identified with 64 PSMs. And so, you know, so this basically gives you an idea about the abundance of uh, these particular taxa that are present in this ocean water sample. The outputs that are again generated through this SQL tabular, and these are the final three outputs that we see here. Uh, and uh, the one of the, the first two that we'll have a look at is this uh, go terms, which are biological processes. So biological processes gives you gives you an idea about uh, an overview about um, the bi biological processes which uh, which which are present in these proteins uh, that are identified. So remember, we identified peptides, and from these peptides, we identified proteins, and these po proteins were then associated uh, were um, assigned to uh, these various 
um, functional terms, um, Go functional terms. And you can see translation seems to be the highest, uh, most um, <clears throat> prevalent um, Go term when we're looking at biological processes. While if we look at uh, molecular functions, we'll see that, uh, so molecular functions at least gives you some, a slightly more granular um, level uh, analysis of your data, wherein it shows you, you know, it not only tells you about that it's from translation, but it actually tells you that this is a structural constituent of the ribosome. And here as well, you can see that's not surprisingly, it's one of the most uh, abundant, um, uh, uh, you know, sequences or uh, most abundant um, uh, go term that's present. There's ATP binding and so on and so forth. So uh, this basically gives you an idea about how this particular microbiome is reacting to the environment or at least in this case what are the most abundant uh, proteins or most abundant uh, gene ontology terms that are getting expressed and the last one is a cellular localization which um, gives you an idea about from uh, you know the localization of these proteins so as you can see most of these seem to come from uh, the cytosol um, of the of, of these bacteria uh, as well as um, you can see th there are quite a few ribosomal proteins, which is also not surprising given that most of the molecular functions and biological processes seem to have that as the highest, um, um, you know, the most abundant uh, go term. <clears throat> now, uh, having said that, uh, this is just looking at one sample and we have uh, made some tools available uh, and I I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about that a little later uh, in this, in this uh, tutorial. Uh, there are tools available which have helped you to compare different conditions based on these quantities and hence this is very uh, this is an important uh, part to note that when you are comparing two conditions you basically need uh, these workflow workflows to be run on two, two of these conditions or you know multiple replicates of these two of these conditions so that you can make some biological interpretation or even look at some differentially expressed uh, taxonomy units or uh, functional terms. So with that, we are kind of at the end of this uh, tutorial. Um, we are, uh, we as we can, as you can see, just to summarize, we started with this input data sets. We invoked this workflow that we downloaded either from the GTN site or from the data library that's present here, and uh, we we ran this. And once we when once we ran this, we we uh, the event, eventual outputs that we got were uh, what are the genera that are present in these samples and what are the different biological processes, molecular functions, uh, go terms uh, that are expressed. Uh, Unipept also gives you um, information about EC terms as well as uh, interpro terms. So if you want to do that, you can always alter this workflow so that you can, you can, you can use that. Uh, but uh, it entirely depends upon what are the biological answers that you're seeking from your data set. So with this, uh, I would like you to, um, uh, I'll strongly encourage you to uh, to provide us a feedback uh, because if you do so, then that will help us to improve this content, uh, even add any new tools or any new parameters that you think would be important. Uh, or as I said, since these workflows are flexible, we can also try to see if any other outputs can be generated so that it can be useful for the metaproteomics community. So, to summarize, the SQLite relational database helps us to summarize the taxonomic information that's present in your data set. For example, here it uses the PSM report um, along with the Unipept uh, LCA table and parses out information so that we get an idea about how many PSMs as well as how many distinct peptides contribute to these particular genera. Similarly, the query tabular tool also helps us to also address the question about what are these organisms doing in this microbiome data set. And for this, it uses the PSM report and 
sequence information as well as the information from go term analysis to give us outputs that can be used to determine which go terms are present in this data set so i'm hoping that this particular tutorial will help you analyze your mass spectrometry data especially if it is from a metaproteomics data set to detect peptide sequences uh, derived from shotgun metagenomic data or any protein database that you have available to match it against i also hope that this helps you to answer the question about what is the taxonomic composition of your metaproteomics data and for this it will use the unipept algorithm especially the lowest common ancestor algorithm to detect unique peptides that are present in your sample and lastly this workflow and this tutorial will help you to analyze your data to detect the functions that are present in your metaproteomics data and for this you could use gene ontology terms as has been shown in the tutorial or you can also use interpro outputs as well as easy term outputs to determine that all the material that was presented here is available on this website that's shown here and i'll strongly recommend you to please provide us a feedback so that we can improve on this tutorial as we go forward in the next few slides i will be discussing a little bit about other tutorials in the field of microbiome analysis that we have at the gtn so we went through this workflow the metaproteomics workflow that we discussed earlier in this tutorial apart from this we have also ability to perform quantitative analysis on these data sets so for example if you have a mass spectrometry data you can either use spectral counts or intensity data to get some quantitative information that can be used to determine functional expression as well as taxonomic expression in order for this to be possible we developed a tool called metaquantome which has been published in this journal uh, in 2019 the metaquantome tool uses peptides that are identified in the workflow that we went through earlier but it also combines it with the precursor intensity or ms1 intensity along with functional annotation as well as taxonomic annotation and all of these inputs are processed by metaquantome which is a suite of statistical analysis tools to generate data exploration outputs volcano plots to determine differential abundance and heat map cluster analysis as has been shown here on the right side for more information about metaquantome you can visit these three links shown here on the galaxy training network the first tutorial will take you through how to generate inputs for metaquantome analysis and this includes some of the tools that we have already covered such as search query peptide shaker and unipept while there will be newer tools such as flash lfq to generate inputs for metaquantum analysis the second and third tutorials will cover functional analysis as well as taxonomic analysis to generate outputs for biological interpretation using metaquantum <clears throat> apart from metaproteomics we also have a tutorial on metatranscriptomics and this has been developed based on a manuscript that was published in 2018 on a suite of tools we have tested this suite of tools and optimized it for meta transcriptomics analysis 
and uh, you can find this tutorial on this link that has been shown here. Lastly, we'd like to thank the Galaxy P team, our collaborators and our grant funding agencies. We also like to thank you for attending this tutorial. Please do not forget to fill in the feedback at the end of the GTN Metaproteomics tutorial website so that we can continue to improve. The tools and workflows used in this study are available on the Galaxy EU instance and the Galaxy training network. Please contact us if you need any information. Thank you for your attention.